Hi everyone, my name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church. Walden Church is a local church in Montgomery, Texas, and we are broadcasting our Sunday sermon today from YouTube because due to the recent health concerns that are going across our nation, we just thought it was the best course of action for y'all to stay home, take care of yourselves. We love you. We miss you terribly. And of course, we'll be back and uh, we'll weather this, right? We will weather the storm. This is probably also a good opportunity for you to like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, you can also hit the little notification bell and that will alert you whenever Walden Church uploads new content. YouTube is probably going to be uh, a good resource over the next couple of weeks as we try to stay in touch uh, during this time of being apart. Also, for a little bit of family matters, a little uh, announcements section. Let's just say that everything that we have on the calendar right now is suspended until we can kind of touch base a little bit more. Your board will still want to get together and talk, uh, but obviously some other activities where we get together as groups, we're just going to suspend those for now. Uh, we'll try to have somebody at the office uh, through the week to answer phones with any questions you have. Of course, we're always available by email and you can always email at office at waldenchurch.com. Also, just as a side note, our current sermon series at Walden Church has been the book of Revelation. We decided to go through the entire book uh, very slowly, piece by piece throughout the entire year, just to kind of break the book down, make it more accessible and more easy to understand. We realize this is a book that raises a lot of questions and it makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. We wanted to uh, just present it in a way that was maybe a little bit more relevant for the year and the time that we live in, plus give you that information that you so desperately want. But I was having lunch with some friends on Wednesday and uh, on the way back, we decided to stop at Walmart. And of course we saw that all the toilet paper was gone and just kind of saw the heightened uh, alertness that many of us seem to be on. And I know uh, with the recent canceling of a couple of days of school and then other churches and other community groups are canceling their events, amusement parks closing down. It'd be very easy to be afraid right now and to have a lot of anxiety and worry and fear. So I thought, you know what, let's address that. Let's talk about those fears. Let's get that out. Let's discuss it. And uh, let's talk about trusting God, right? Trusting the Lord and not being afraid. So my sermon's prepared. It's up there on the podium. I'm going to grab this camera and take it up there and let's have a little church. What do you think? Let's go. So we're gonna be taking a little break from Revelation today, and I just felt we should address some of the panic that's been going on in our little town. Uh, what with school closing two days early and there being no toilet paper in Walmart, I just felt like, you know, we need to get a handle on this and simply repeat this mantra to ourselves. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And during this, if you see me looking down, it's because uh, my notes are down here, right? I'm, my notes are down here, treating this like I would if it were a Sunday morning. I suppose I could look out over the audience and pretend that you're sitting out there, but I feel like that's a little disingenuous. I'd rather just talk to the camera, talk to, to your eye line. But uh, yeah, don't be afraid. We've said that before. We've said that to people. You know, you say that to somebody when uh, they don't want to jump in the pool or that, you know, they've never gone swimming before. You say, don't be afraid. Or when they're going to try a brand new thing at a restaurant, something they've never eaten before, we'll say, don't, you know, don't be afraid. Or, you know, somebody's going to get on a roller coaster and they're afraid. Or your child runs into your bedroom at night and, and says they just had a nightmare and you hold them and you say, don't be afraid. Right? Uh, we uh, went through this at Christmas. This last Christmas, this last winter, we had a sermon series that was entitled Fear Not. And we were talking about all the times that an angel or a messenger from God would come and, and speak and share good news. And the first thing they would say is, don't be afraid. Like, I know this is surprising. I know you didn't expect this. I know seeing an angel is a little overwhelming, but I'm actually bringing good news, so don't be afraid. And maybe right now, you know, with the news reports and the statistics and the figures about uh, COVID-19 and, and how it's our current breaking story, you can't really go anywhere or turn on any station without hearing something about it. It's no wonder that we're afraid. But don't underestimate fear. It's a very powerful emotion. It can grab us, it can grip us, and it only wants to give you more terror and more dread. I mean, consider, consider this. The more scared you feel, 
the scarier things will seem. Right? I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that your fear response is elevated when you're already scared. Like, if you were to walk into a darkened room and you can't see anything, maybe you're in an unfamiliar room that you don't know and you're kind of reaching around for the light switch and someone decides to play a practical joke on you and they tap you on the back and they say, boo, you're going to jump out of your skin, right? But if you had walked into the room with the lights on and you'd clearly seen the person, of course them saying boo to you isn't going to scare you. Or let's say you're on an airline and you already have a little tiny fear of flying. When that turbulence hits, you're going to grip the sides of your seats and you're going to panic. You're going to say, ah, right? Or, or maybe you're already a little fearful about your job security. And your boss only wants to congratulate you on the most recent project you did. And he says, hey, you know, Bill, come in my office. Well, now you're even more scared because you don't know what's going on. Let's say you're watching a, a nature documentary. And you're, you're watching something about uh, poisonous snakes or you're watching a documentary about uh, jumping spiders, right? And then halfway through the documentary, you just feel this little tickle on your neck. Now, it's just a loose thread from your sweater or, or from the pillow or, or from uh, the couch, but you're gonna jump out of your seat and you're gonna slap your neck a hundred times because you're already scared, right? That fear response is already elevated. Another thing, is once you're scared, fear is going to dictate the actions you take. We know this. We know, we know all the uh, responses to fear. There, there's uh, freeze and fight and flight and fright, right? <laughs> freeze means you stop what you're doing and you focus so much on the fear that it's, you have tunnel vision and that's like the only thing you can focus on and your head is screaming, buy all the hand sanitizer, buy all the toilet paper, right? With fight, you decide that you're gonna fight this threat off, and with flight, you just wanna run away completely. And I think when the experience is so overwhelming, you just lock up and you experience the fright of it all. You don't fight or flee, in fact, you don't do anything. You just obsess and you complain and you take no action at all. And you, be, you just being continually in this fright mode is going to lead you to feeling despair, lead you to feeling like everything's hopeless. You see, that's because fear wants to steal your joy. Fear wants to steal your joy. It wants to take your courage. It wants to leave you cold. It wants to leave you trembling. Fear wants to manipulate you. Fear wants to taunt you especially with the unknown and things you don't know anything about, and scare you, scare you with the fear of dying, the fear of living, the fear of failure, the fear of defeat, the fear of rejection, the fear of being alone. Also, that it accomplishes what? Creates more joyless people. Fear creates joyless people. You see, fear doesn't want you to reach your goals, right? It wants to get inside your head. Fear wants to distract you from all the good things in life, from all the blessings that are in your life. And fear wants to take your eyes off of living and hope that you only see the dull and the drab in life. And today I want to encourage you with these words. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know that the phrase, don't be afraid, is in the Bible at least 88 times. Even more so if you count other ways of saying, don't be afraid. And whenever don't be afraid is being said, it's almost always being spoken by God to his people. So if God is saying, don't be afraid to his people, then we know that we can trust those words. I got two stories for you from the Bible. Two stories. I got an Old Testament story that maybe you don't know so well and a New Testament story that's very familiar. So first, the Old Testament story, okay? So we're going to be in 2 Kings, and we'll put the Bible up on the screen for you so that you can see uh, and follow along. But in 2 Kings, uh, Israel is divided into two different kingdoms. So you've got uh, Israel that's over in the north, and you have Judah that's over in the south. And Ben-Hadad is the king of Damascus at this time. He's the bad king, Ben-Hadad. And he's hunting 
King Joram, who is the king of the north. And what happens is Ben-Hadad keeps running into problems. Uh, he'd gather his men together and he'd map out the strategy. He'd set up everybody for an ambush and Joram would always escape or, or he wouldn't even be there. You know, they, they, they would lay a trap for him and they just couldn't understand, well, how is he getting this intel? But what was happening this whole time was Elisha, the prophet, was warning the king of Israel about where all these ambushes were gonna take place. And Elisha knew because he was listening to God. So whenever Elisha would warn the king, uh, Ben-Hadad's ambush would always fail. And so it wasn't too long before Ben-Hadad got mad and he didn't like losing. And he was convinced that somebody in his army was feeding this intel to the enemy. And so what he did was he got all of his chief officials together and he got them into a little meeting and he said, you know what, I know one of you guys is a mole. I know one of you is a rat. You are leaking intel to our enemy. They're escaping our traps, escaping our ambushes. And I want, to know, I want you to know one of you is going to die for this. And so everybody at that meeting was kind of looking around going, it's not me, it's not me, right? And then one of his servants said, I think I know what's happening. The Lord is telling Elisha about your plans. And Elisha is the one that's giving your enemy the information. And so surprisingly, the king believes him. And he says, well, we got to find Elisha and put an end to this. So it wasn't before uh, too long that word started to get back to Elisha. Elisha's in Dotham, but Elisha receives the information just a little too late. And by then, Dotham is already surrounded by his enemy. They came in the middle of the night. They surrounded the town so that Elisha and his servants couldn't leave. And they were hoping to surprise him when he woke up. So what happened? Well, let's find out. This is 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. It says, when the, when the servant of the man of God, this is Elisha's servant, when he arose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So what happened was, early that morning, Elisha's servant woke up, grabbed a cup of coffee, put on his slippers, walked out of the tent, went across the sand to bend down to pick up the morning paper. And as he gets back up and he looks around, he sees that during the night, the enemy had surrounded them quickly puts the paper down, turns on his heel, starts to run back to the tent as Elisha is coming out. And he says, Elisha, what are we going to do? And what does Elisha say in verse 16? He said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Don't be afraid. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What happens in this moment? The servant has his eyes opened by God and he's able to see what has always been around him. He's able to see exactly what Elisha has already known, that there was help from the Lord. Right? And he saw the hill full of horses and these chariots of fire. There was an army of God that had also come to protect them. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine being that servant and then opening your eyes and having your eyes open and all of a sudden then you can see. Now you can see this army of God that was surrounding your enemies. And that it wasn't just you and Elisha against everybody. You had the entire army of God on your side. That must have been incredible. What a huge... What a huge scene. But that can be so like us that, you know, when we can't see the big picture, when we don't have all the information, we can panic just like Elisha's servant, can't we? You know, one morning you woke up and you found out that your city was surrounded. One morning you woke up and you realized the enemy had come in the middle of the night and now you're trapped or now you're on house arrest. Now you're on a self-lockdown and you're afraid and you don't know what to do. You know, sometimes the enemy that surrounds us is the weather outside, or it's a health problem, or it's the storm, or it's finances, or it's relationships. 
Sometimes it's even death. Oftentimes it could be something smaller. Maybe it's the fear of rejection or the fear of failure. But whoever it is or whatever it is, the bottom line is fear takes us over. And we just think there's no way out of this. There's no escape. What do you do? When it it seems like there's no way out and it's hopeless, what do you do? Well, you need to do what Elisha's servant did. You need to stop and have your eyes opened. You need to stop and have your eyes open. You need to see the horses and the chariots of fire that God has already sent to protect you. You need to believe in the mighty forces that are already at work in your life. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How can we do that? How can we have our eyes opened? I mean, we should continue to stay grounded in the Lord, right? Stay connected. Pray. Pray that God will get us through these situations. Pray through our trials. Pray through our difficulties. Uh, This is exactly what James talks about in his first letter. You know, in his first chapter, uh, James 1, 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers. Count what? Count what joy? All of it. Right? He says all of it. When? When you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, well then what? What should you do? Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And then what? And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Don't the problems in life toss you around? Don't you feel like you're being tossed about on on the sea, blown here and there, and just unstable, and the the flood waters of life are starting to rise? Don't you feel like it's hard to navigate life, especially when uh, there's a difficult time? James says, consider them all joy. James says, rejoice in those hardships. But we've all been there, right? We've all been there. I mean, I could ask you, uh, you know, what, what are you afraid of? What are your top 10 fears uh, being an American right now? I could ask you that, but uh, I actually looked it up. <laughs> I looked it up. So I came across this study. I'm going to put the uh, graphic up on the screen for you. This is, I don't know, this is, I, I kind of feel like this is funny, but here's the top 10 fears of the highest percentage of people who say they're afraid or very afraid, all right? So here's your top 10 fears in America. Number one, corrupt government officials. 73% of America said they're afraid of corrupt government officials. Number two, pollution of our oceans, rivers, and lakes. Number three, pollution of drinking water. So we're really scared of polluted water, okay? Very scared of polluted water. Uh, Four, that's when finances come in. Not having enough money for the future. So you're more worried about water than you are about money. Okay. Number five, people I love becoming seriously ill. Number six, people I love dying. So we're more afraid of all those other things before we're even afraid of the people we love becoming ill or dying? That just seems a little unbalanced, right? Seven is air pollution. Eight is the extinction of plants and animals. Nine is global warming. Ten is high medical bills. Whether that's you or not, or whether we think that list is wrong or not, we all are going to face difficulties in life, right? We're all going to face hardships. And for as much as we have valleys in our life, we're going to have peaks. For as much as we have low points, we have high points, right? So what's the answer? How, how can we keep our boat a little bit more stable when the waters of life seem to be rising on us? James says, ask God. James says, pray, pray, pray that God will give you wisdom. Pray that God will help you to outlast the trial. Pray that you will endure and pray that you will consider all of these hardships as joy. 
That's what James says. Joy. The Bible is always doing this, telling me that I should look at my hardships as joy, that I should rejoice in trials, rejoice in hardships. How do I do that? Simple. Like Elisha's servant, we pray that our eyes are opened and that we can see things for what they really are. That when we feel hemmed in and feel hopeless and feel like we're crowded and like our enemies are all around us, we pray, Lord, would you open my eyes so that I can see the truth, so that I can see you and see your protection that I know is already there. Because what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen when your eyes are opened? Then you're gonna see the true nature of the fight, right? It's, it's, you're gonna see that it's not us that is surrounded. It's actually our enemy. You're gonna see that we are not hemmed in, that we are not defenseless. Elisha's servant, he thought that it was two versus a thousand. Yeah, that would make you panic, right? Those aren't good odds. It's just him and Elisha against all these men and all these chariots and all these swords. But he was wrong, wasn't he? It wasn't just the two of them. It wasn't just him and Elisha. It was them plus the army of God. Listen, anytime we are with God, we are in the majority. Anytime we are on God's side, we are on the winning side. All right. Let's look at our New Testament story. And I promised you, this is a story that uh, you're more familiar with, right? A story we're all, we're all familiar with. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, On that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side, the other side of the lake. And, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And the great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he was in the stern, and he was asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And verse 4 says, They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, every time I read this, I think to myself, this is such a crazy story, right? Such a crazy story because these disciples had heard him preach, heard his teaching. They had seen his miracles with their own eyes, seen him heal physical flesh, tissue, right? But in this moment, it's obvious that they still do not understand who Jesus is. They saw him as someone who was a powerful man, but someone with limitations. I mean, sure, he can heal a person, he can cure disease, he can make the dead come back to life, but, he, but the weather, he can't control the weather. <laughs> but here's the thing. We read this story, we read this story now with 2020 uh, eyes, and we think, man, those disciples were dumb. Right? We think, man, those disciples were ignorant. They're just backwards fishermen. But how often do we make the same mistake? How often do we limit God? You know, we say, well, God doesn't do miracles anymore. God doesn't speak to people anymore. God doesn't move and interact in this day and age now like he used to. And then so what happens? We encounter a new storm. A storm we'd never seen before. And then we become so unsure. Oh, maybe God doesn't have power over this. Maybe God doesn't have authority over this. And so where do we go? We go to the news. We go to social media. We go to rumor. We go to the internet for our comfort. We go there for our wisdom. Tell me something. When everybody else is panicking, where is Jesus? He's asleep, right? Was he feeding into the panic? No, he's unconscious, he's zonked out. Jesus slept because he trusted the Father. Jesus had the assurance that no matter what was happening on the outside of the boat, inside, 
there was nothing to fear. Did the people get wet? Sure, but that was it. What's troubling is that God's people today, we don't have any stronger trust than people did back then. I wish I could say that we trusted God more now than they did then, but I don't think it's true. We hide in our bathtub with every rogue gust of wind and rain. We have to remember that no matter what, God is there. Whom shall we fear? Are we going to fear the storm? Or are we going to fear the one who makes the storm? See, I don't, I don't fear the storm. I don't fear the rain because I'm in love with the God who made the rain. We take a lesson from Jesus and we just learn to sleep. Learn to sleep even in the storm. Like James says, we, we just count it all as joy, right? Like Elisha's servant whose eyes were opened and he saw all of God's protection all around him. We just gotta hold on to that. You know, it's too bad. It's too bad actually that the disciples didn't remember their own Sunday school lessons in that moment. Because this same story is clearly spelled out in the book of Psalm. Psalm 107 gives us this assurance. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for his wondrous works. You see, we're all going to face storms and we're all going to go through difficult times. Yes, you'll have some seasons where it feels like God is nowhere and, and, and you're going to get wet for sure. <laughs> you're going to get wet and you're going to shout, Oh, my master, what shall we do? And the way I see it is at that point, you have two choices. You can either jump out of the boat and you can swim on your own power. Hopefully you won't drown or you can grab your pillow and you can just trust that God will bring you through the storm. You might get wet. Your boat might get damaged. You might even lose some cargo, but you're going to endure because God will see you through. Hebrews 13, five says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Always remember that God will not abandon us if we make room for him. So we follow the model of Jesus who chose to rest in God's love, who chose to rest in God's character and, and nature rather than join in the fear of the people who did not realize who he was and who was watching over them. Like Elisha's servant, if we can open our eyes, we will see the true nature of the conflict. When fear grips us and steals our joy and immobilizes our service, when we feel outgunned, when we feel outnumbered, if we would just open our eyes and see. Because when your eyes are opened, we're going to see the true nature of things. And we're going to see that we're not alone. And it's not us versus them, but rather it's God and us. And when we open our eyes, we will also experience the presence of God. We will see him all around us. When we open our eyes, we see the Lord and we are reminded that he is there just like he promised. There's something about being in the presence of someone that is stronger than we are, that just smooths our fear, gives us assurances, melts away our tears. A shepherd boy with just a sling faces a 10 foot giant that has an entire nation shaking in their boots, but because he knows the almighty God is with him, he is not afraid. When Isaac was afraid, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid because I am with you. 
When the prophet Jeremiah was afraid of the king of Babylon, God said, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. In his farewell speech to the people, Moses told the people as they were about to enter the promised land, Do not be afraid, because the Lord your God goes with you. The good news of life is we don't weather the storms alone. God goes with us. As a matter of fact, God sent his son to die for us so that he would be with us in these storms. So I would just say right here as we close, as we wrap up, um, just go to God in prayer. Go to God in prayer and ask him to open your eyes. Especially if you feel like there's a truth out there that you can't see. If you're having difficulty reading the passage from James and saying, I need to find that joy in the difficult times, and I can't. I can't find the joy right now in these moments. And Lord, I need you to open my eyes so that I can see you, see your protection, see you there. I want to be able to rest knowing that you're there, knowing that you've got my back, knowing that you're protecting me and protecting my family. You know, I think back to when I was talking about how you know, a child can run into your room and they're afraid of a nightmare or, or something that, that's in their room that they don't know what it is. And as a parent, you take them by the hand and you lead them back into the room and you turn the lights on and you say, see, there's nothing to be afraid of. It was, it was, it was just your robe. And it was, it was just this pile of toys and a blanket was on it. That's what we need. We need those assurances. And God's our father. And he wants to give us those same assurances, just like he did for Elisha's servant. He said, you know what? I'm going to turn the lights on for you so that you can see. The enemy isn't scary. Uh, you can see that my power is greater. You can see that I, I've got you, that I'm protecting you. I think if you need that, you know, take that advice from James and pray about it. Ask God. And if it helps, this might be a great time to, to bring back a family prayer. To, to get the family together as a, as a complete unit and say, you know what, I, I know we're all scared and the school got canceled and, you know, you've been to the store and the, there's nothing on the shelves and, you know, the governor has declared a state of emergency. It's, it's natural for us to be afraid. This might be a great time to pray with your children as you put them to bed. This might be a great time to pray with that stranger at the store or that mom that you see that looks overwhelmed when she's looking up and there's no baby wipes, or there's no milk, or there's no formula. This might be a great time to extend the hand of mercy and grace and pay for the groceries of the person behind us. This might be a great time to walk into a little mom and pa shop and sit down and order and have dinner or to continue to buy your supplies from the same stores because you believe in your economy and you wanna bolster it and you want to support those people because you know that they have to put food on their tables too, we will weather the storm, right? Yeah, we will weather the storm. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this is awkward <laughs> to pray to an empty church, to pray on YouTube. But that's the thing, is we know that you are still with us. You are still present. And even though this church building that I am standing in is empty, I know that the church is still together and we are still one and we are still united. We are still deeply connected and in love with each other. And while we might miss each other right now, miss that connection, it'll just make us look forward to that time where we can all get back together again. The joy of seeing each other and being able to embrace one another and to shake each other's hand. We look forward to that day once again. And if we took those times for granted, we are sorry. Because right now I feel like we miss the fellowship. We miss the fellowship more than anything else. Lord, be with each one of our church brothers and sisters. Be with our church grandchildren, our church grandparents. We miss them too. Bring them comfort. Watch over those in our congregation who are sick. Watch over those who are ill. Watch over our community in the weeks and months to come. Protect our school. Protect our stores and our shop owners. Be with our first responders. 
ease the stress levels of our doctors and nurses, watch over our hospitals, and be with this world, Lord. It doesn't matter if it's the United States or Italy or China or Germany. Lord, we are all your children, and we know that you watch over all of us and protect all of us. So be with us. May this be a time when your world leans more heavily on you, reaches out to you more through prayer, in a time when all of us have our eyes opened and that we are able to see you all around us. Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you soon. Bye. Hey, so I hope that wasn't a little weird. Uh, it just felt a little awkward preaching to an empty church, but just know that for me, I got halfway through the entire thing before I realized the lights were making my camera uh, cycle back and forth, and I thought it was getting, making people like motion sickness. So I had to delete the entire thing that I had started, and I actually preached this uh, two and a half times just to get the footage right. So like I said, hey, make sure you like the channel, subscribe to Walden's Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube page, hit your notification bells and buttons so that when we post new content or we just wanna send out an alert or just give people some information or some announcements that you get, uh, that, you get that information. I mean, this might be one of the ways that we communicate in the weeks to come. And so we just want you to get that information. We'll try to still be at the church, still try to answer phones and be there for you. Of course, we're going to be watching our emails and answer those as well. Stay safe, stay healthy. I love you guys. We'll see you soon. Bye.